Um, made it through one big day of fun and you're here for our second big keynote. <laughs> so that's great. Um, just quickly, where are you all today? Where are we? <laughs> Worcester, for those of you joining us on Friday, if you're not sure, I think all the Friday people are local, so they should know how to say Worcester, but good job. You may all move to Massachusetts. So I do want to just once again thank our sponsors, our champion level sponsors, Emerald Data Networks, Equinox Open Library Initiative, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative. I hope you all enjoyed the Everything New England buffet last night. And if you want to like give them a little round of applause. <laughs> I also want to thank Pales and Spark as being an advocate level sponsor and our alley level sponsors, Biblio Commons, Cool, Markive, Mobius, Kipu, Sage, Stat Courier, Unique Management. So please do stop by the exhibitors um, as well when we are uh, on your two breaks today. Two housekeeping things. We have lightning talk signups for this afternoon. I think there's two or three spots still open on anything evergreen. Um, there's also dine around signed up sheets and there's still space in a lot of the restaurants if you haven't signed up and you want to, and there's a pub crawl QR code and a schedule out there, which will happen, uh, later tonight at eight o'clock. And then anyone going to the Woo Sox game, we are meeting in the lobby at 6 PM to walk over as a group. And then with a little more <laughs> to do, I am very excited to introduce our next speaker. Some of you may be very familiar with Kathy Lucier. She was very active in the Evergreen community when she was project coordinator for the Massachusetts Library Network Cooperative, formerly known as MassLink. During those years, she participated on the Evergreen web team, the documentation interest group, the oversight board, was chair of the outreach committee, and was a core committer and 2.12 release manager. She now leads the Sales Library Network, a multi-type consortia in southeastern Massachusetts, and she's here to talk to us about burnout. Good morning, Evergreen. I, I have to say, I don't think I have ever been so excited to speak to a group of people as I am today. I am just so happy to see all of you. So thank you for scheduling your conference in Worcester. I'm convinced you did it just so I could go and please don't um, you know, break my illusions about that. Um, and thank you for accepting my presentation proposal because I, I'm just so excited to be able to talk to you about this topic. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping matters. I'm not wearing my lanyard now, but you'll notice I have a yellow lanyard. And I wanna thank you all for continuing to do this. I, I, I think it's a great thing that our community does. Um, but while I'm speaking, yes, you may take my photo. So I'm giving my consent right now. Another thing I wanna mention, I know I've been out of the community for four and a half years, and I haven't seen a lot of what's going on, but through this presentation, I'm gonna use the word we a lot. I have stopped trying to break the habit of saying we. It's just, I, I say it, um, but I understand that I'm gonna talk about a lot of things that I need, think need to be done in the community. And I quite possibly will not be here to do the heavy lifting. So if I overstep, Please, in advance, I ask your forgiveness, but I do this because I care about the community and I want to see you all moving in a great direction. But anyways, I have a lot to talk about. I did not do a trial run of this, so I'm just giving you forewarning. This could last two hours and not the 45 minutes. Okay. So anyways, I want to start by, um, where are the catalogers? Is that who I heard laughing? A, a tip, if you're talking to librarians, always give a shout out to the catalogers because you won't go wrong. And, you know, because of them, we can find our stuff. So yay for the catalogers. <laughs> and my network catalog that helped me with this. Um, so I want to first start by explaining what MassLink is because some of you don't know me. And even those who do know me, I don't know that everyone understood what MassLink was. So this was a project that started in 2010. And what it was, was three consortia in Massachusetts that decided to work together on their evergreen implementation. 
So this is something that I don't think had ever been done before. It was new and different, and we really didn't know what we were doing. Um, but we did it because there were three executive directors out there who had the vision to say, you know, if we're moving to an open source system, it, it, it will be a lot better if we work together. So for those first two years, um, my salary was funded by an LSTA grant. And of course, it was a big project, so we had to file for an extension. And uh, fortunately for me, um, KCLS still had their IMLS program back then, and they helped um, carry me through uh, the last part of the grant project so that I could keep um, having a salary and keep helping these networks. Um, then in 2012, these consortia, they took a risk. They took a bold move, and they all decided that they would pool their funds to hire someone who was not providing direct support to their systems to continue helping them with the Evergreen project. And, you know, it wasn't just the executive directors there. It was their entire membership who decided this is something that matters. This is something that's going to make our move to ever our, our recent move to Evergreen even better. And, um, you know, I'm very appreciative of that, but it, it really was visionary in my mind. So the project grew, and by 2015, we were able to hire a part-time developer. And it was very exciting, we were growing, and my idea was we'd have someone who could actually work on our development projects, but in, I, I was thinking big picture down the road, maybe someone who could help other evergreen sites with their development. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes you make plans and they don't come to pass. And at that point, it's when one of our consortia, MVLC, decided they were going to move off of Evergreen. So those of you who are consortia, imagine that a third of your membership decides that it's going to step down and what that would do for your budget. Uh, so it, it was a crisis moment for the, um, the collaborative. But once again, Noble and CW Mars, they took that risk. They made the bold move to continue supporting this project, even though, I mean, I did consulting for them, but I wasn't doing direct support of the system. And the more I continued with the project, more and more of my time was actually given to community work and not work for CW Mars and Noble because they were experts by then and they didn't need my help as much as they did in the beginning. Um, but they continued it. And at that point, the MassLink Development Initiative was born, was born. And those of you would know that now as the, I get this wrong, Evergreen Community Development Initiative, ECDI. So yes, thank you and Evergreen Indiana for taking that over. Um, so by the time I left in 2018, we had eight consortia and libraries participating in MassLink. Um, but I want to say, even with that additional participation, even though there was an admin fee for every development partner, CW, Mars, and Noble always put more funding towards my position, even though so little of my time was spent for their needs. They basically subsidized my position in all that time. So I left in 2018. You all met in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania uh, in 2019, and because of social media, I am aware that um, it was actually four years ago yesterday, because it came up in my Facebook memories, that Gail and Charlton stood before all of you to acknowledge the contributions I made to the project and to give me a shout out. And really, that meant a lot to me, Galen, and thank you for doing that. And it still means a lot to me. But I also feel like that recognition was misplaced because I'm looking around this room and I see so many people that if they had my job where they were given the time to do this, they would have maybe not done the exact same thing, but they would have made a big impact on the community like I did. It wasn't me who did that. It was CW Mars and Noble who did that. So I would like right now to take that recognition Galen gave me and turn it to CW Mars and Noble their libraries, and particularly Ron Gagnon, who is the last of the original MassLink executive directors, who is still at Evergreen Conferences. So please, if you could give them a shout out. And really, if you could give an applause to every organization here who has employees who contribute to the project for the sake of making the project better, because that's what we need. So when some people saw what I was speaking on, you may have wondered, well, is she speaking on this because she left because she was burned out? And I wanna say no. 
and the reason I was not was because I had, you know, I was given the opportunity to do this. But probably a year after I left the community, something happened that made me realize maybe I wasn't burned out, but maybe there were some other things going on that were stressing me out. And I'm, you know, later on in the presentation, I'll, I'll talk about what that was. So, um, ooh, already 10 minutes in. So let's talk about burnout. Um, so burnout, this is important. It's defined as an occupational phenomenon. It is not a medical condition at all. And it's chronic job stressors. So if you're going through a migration and you're very stressed about it, but then you know that stress levels off, that's not burnout, that's not chronic. This is a constant pressure that doesn't get alleviated. Um, a lot of people think burnout's when you're overworked, but it's not. There are actually three components for burnout. And so here um, are the components. So there's uh, the Maslach Burnout Inventory, uh, which was developed by Christina Maslach. And once again, this is not a diagnostic tool. It's a research tool. It's not diagnostic because it's not a medical condition. So there are five profiles you can have. So overextended. So if you're off exhausted, overworked, if that's what you're feeling and that's the only thing you're feeling, you're not burned out, you're overextended. Um, disengaged, uh, you get increased mental distance from your job. This is cynicism. It's basically you're reacting negatively to external factors. Ineffective, you feel like you're not effective in what you're doing. You have negative feelings towards yourself. So this is more of an internal thing. So you have the external factor and the internal factors. If you score negatively in all three areas, that's the definition of burnout. So you're feeling overextended, you're really negative about everything going on in your workplace, and you're also feeling like you can't make a difference. That's when you start to have burnout. Now, generally people will fit in one or two of these categories. They don't fit in all three. And according to Maslick, um, when measured properly, there's only about 10 to 15% of employees who fit the strict definition. Um, you have twice as many fitting the uh, profile for engagement, which means you fit, um, have positive scores in all three pl places. Still, that leaves more than half of people fitting at least one of these profiles, and those people could be heading towards burnout. And certainly the last three years hasn't helped um, people get to a more positive place. So these are places in the workplace culture that you can look at if you want to help burnout. Um, this is in the workplace. I would argue that in an open source communities, these are six places you need to look at too um, to alleviate those, um, those symptoms of burnout. So, um, you know, there's working too much. Do you have autonomy in what you can do? Do you get proper recognition? And this isn't necessarily salary. This is being recognized in some way. I mean, it could be cookies, I guess, um, but something that says, you know, you've done a good thing. Um, are you in a toxic environment or is it really good people to work with? Is it fair? Do you, can you take pride in the values of whatever organization you're working for? Or are you asked to do things that you think are ethically wrong? These, these are the things that you need to look at. And I think as an open source community, we you know, do well in a lot of these areas. Uh, the values area, certainly there's a lot of positive values to libraries, to open source. There may be other uh, smaller values about how we do things that, that might hit you, but I think overall you're doing a good thing. So you're not gonna get hit there. Um, reward, sometimes, you know, maybe you're not getting the reward. Uh, community in this community, I think we tend to score high on. And this is, and I've talked to a lot of people in preparation for this talk. And, and you know, time and time again, people were saying this is really a positive community overall. Workload, I think we get hit really badly on. Um, so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today addresses workload, but there are a couple other things I address too. One of the questions that come with evergreen burnout is because you're doing evergreen work as part of your job, the question is, is it evergreen that's causing the burnout? Or is it your job that's causing the burnout? So obviously, 
whatever's happening, the community can't fix what's happening in your job. So all we can do is really work on those community things. Um, so, I'm just gonna take a little side trip here. So in preparing for this, one of the things I looked at is this chaos project. Has anyone heard of the chaos project other than the people I've already talked to about it? Okay. So this is a project and it was it's about five years old, I think. And what they do is they establish metrics and models for measuring open source health and, and it's uh, support for open source software that helps uh, analyze the data. and evaluates whether you have a healthy open source project. Um, so they do metrics for things like test coverage, um, the elephant factor, which is the distribution of work in the community across companies. Um, it looks at diversity, it looks at project engagement, and it looks at burnout. So I used their metric for burnout um, in talking to some of our community members to get an idea on how they were feeling about the project and whether they felt there was burnout in the project. Um, if anyone is ever interested in working on this project to kind of measure our community health, I would definitely be interested in partnering up with you because I wanted to look at it more closely, but it's a time thing. So the question is, do we have burnout in this project? Um, I talked to contributors from all facets of the project. I talked to core commit, a lot of core committers. Uh, I talked to people on the board. I talked to documentation people. And one of the questions I asked them is, how do you feel about working on this project? Um, so here are some of the words that came up. Ineffective, discouraged, tired, demoralizing, overwhelming and stressful, resentment, disconnected, a struggle to get more than a handful of people to do stuff, Frustrated's big because that came up over and over and over again. Now, the people I talk to are the people all of you are relying on to keep the software moving forward. And this is what I'm hearing. Not everybody had this, by the way, but I'm just saying a lot of the people, this is what I'm hearing from the people you depend on to making sure that you have a release coming out or you're having good documentation. Uh, going along with it, or that they're trying to move the governance forward. So there, there's a lot of frustration in feeling like they can't make a difference going on here. And I think that should be a cause for concern. The same people and other people also had a lot of positives to say how they're feeling. So there are a lot of mixed feelings on this. So we had things like fun, exciting, joy, Opportunities, That's, there are a lot of opportunities. I love this one. It's a place I want to be. It's a place I want to participate. It's one of the most rewarding projects I've ever worked on. Um, and even the people who were mostly negative, I bet you if I asked them, they felt these things at one time, even if they're not feeling them now, they would probably say yes. Um, and that's, it, it's just, you know, that's the way it is. You kind of have mixed feelings on things. Um, some of the people I talked to noted that their stressors happen in the workplace, like we talked about, and they actually work on the community to relieve the stress. So there are some people who are seeing it as something that actually helps with their burnout and, and doesn't make it worse. So it, it, it all depends on your level of engagement with the project as well. And we can't discount the effect of COVID on all of this. A number of people indicated that the fact that we haven't had in-person conferences for four, four years, has it been four years? Um, had, that that really affected their ab ability to get re-energized about the project. It, this is a place where, you know, as you're starting to feel down, you connect with, with people and it reminds you, oh yeah, this is why I love being in this project. So, you know, that obviously is a factor we can't, um, we can't forget. One thing I wanna mention is, we're, we're fortunate though um, that unlike other projects, we can work on this as part of our jobs. So I was reading a lot about burnout in other open source communities. And a lot of those, they're people who are just doing it 
as part of their own time. So they work a day job, they go home, and then they have to work on a project. And a lot of the projects just have one single maintainer. So they don't have this group of people that can help balance it out. So we do have, you know, a something that other projects don't have. I remember I went to, when I was in the community, I went to the Open Source Bridge Conference in Portland, Oregon once, and um, I was introducing myself to someone, and they said, wait a minute, you're working on open source as part of your job? And I said, yeah, it's part of my job. They were like, oh, that is so cool. I wish I could have a job where I worked on open source. And it really made me think, oh, wow, that, you know, these people, they're just doing it because they love it, and they're getting, you know, no financial reward for it. So it, we are fortunate in that respect. I want to highlight this one now. Where is it? Passionate about making the project succeed. I want to ask a question, and don't feel compelled to raise your hand if you don't truly feel this way. How many people, res this resonates with you, you're passionate about making the project succeed? Okay, so this came from Mike Rylander. Now, obviously, he's passionate about making the project succeed. He's one of the original developers. He has he is devoted a lifetime of work to this project. Mike Rylander, Bill Erickson, Jason Etheridge, you would expect this from them. But think about it. We all arrived at the project at different times. And because it's open source, we were able to develop that ownership into this evergreen software just by whatever contribution we make, whether it's code, documentation, working with the community. And we feel so much ownership in the project that all of these people also feel that same passion that one of the original developers has to make sure this project succeeds. And that's a great thing, but it's a double-edged sword because this is one of the reasons people feel burnout. When one thing they find found is that how passionate you are about your work is more likely to lead to burnout. Um, so these are the Mayo Clinic risk factors for burnout, and the two that I've bolded um, relate to that passion. You identify so strongly with work that you lack balance between your work life and your personal life, or you work in a helping profession. So this hits us hard because, hold on. I'm a librarian. I am passionate about, pub, about libraries, mostly working with public libraries, but really any library. I truly believe that libraries are the equalizer in our society. I truly believe they play a pivotal role in democracy, guaranteeing access to information for all, regardless of their means. This is something I am so passionate about. I'm also passionate about open source software. I am convinced that open source is what allows libraries to maintain ownership of their tools, to ensure that we can protect patron confidentiality and privacy, that it's not just suddenly gonna go off the rails in the interest of marketing or something like that. I, I'm passionate about all these things, and this is the thing that's gonna make it harder for me to not burn out on a project. So, you know, that's something to think about. Um, this is why I've spent a large part of my free time over the last few months researching burnout and doing this presentation for a community I'm not even a member of anymore. Obviously, I'm still passionate about it. So, you know, that's going to hit you if you're with the burnout. Um, the other thing about it is when you feel, when you're doing this, it can feel incredibly satisfying to pour yourself in to that thing you're passionate about. So Galen once pointed me to a New York Magazine article, and um, I will, when these get posted, have the list of resources. I have a lot of resources. They're not there yet, because uh, I'm a little deadline oriented. But um, one thing the article talks about is how burnout happens where there is a large gap between expectation and reality. So, if people who have high expectations are more likely to see a larger gap. Younger people are more likely to experience burnout because you know they're all go-getters, they're ready to change the world. Uh, happily married people are less likely to experience burnout because they don't rely on their job for fulfillment. Uh, notice I said happily married. Uh, 
childless people are more likely to burn out than those with children, which surprised me because I would think the stress of having children would lead to the feeling of burnout, but it isn't because they have that family support that helps, you know, provide that fulfillment that makes them step away from their job. So, you know, that's a huge thing. I just want to take a moment to look at this one other factor. You try to be everything to everyone. This doesn't hit everyone, but it's known as the hero syndrome. And I won't ask you to identify yourselves, but you know who you are. Um, those are the people who like to be the go-to people. Uh, you know, they say yes to everything. They say yes, even when everything in their brain screams at them to say no. They take things on because they don't trust that anyone else can do them. Um, it, it's not only an issue with burnout, but it has implications for the project because it leads to bottlenecks because someone's taking on too much and can't do everything that they're supposed to do. And it leads to over-reliance on one person. So, you know, the big thing with people who have this issue is trying to steer them towards being mentors, pairing them up with people so that they can learn from them and maybe the person they pair them up with can document what's going on so that we're not overly reliant on that person. So I'm gonna go one slide on self-care, okay? Disconnect at the end of the day, engage in fulfilling activities and off work hours, say no, um, clearly step down when you are no longer able to fulfill a role. That's a big one. Every time and time again, I've seen people stay in a role even though they really can't do it anymore. Um, step down from it and leave the room open for someone else to do it. Once again, it leads to bottlenecks. And I, I'm, I have, have a, had an experience once where I stepped into a role, chair of the web team, even though I knew I couldn't do it. And I held one meeting and the web team never met again. You don't want someone doing that. Um, exercise, sleep. So we all know you need to do these. These are good things um, and for any mental health issues. But that's not how you cure your burnout. Uh, community care, lead by example, set boundaries, and people see you doing that, and they learn to do it. Um, ask people how they're doing, but don't pry. Be available, but don't offer solutions. Um, believe people when they say they're overworked. And if you can try to help them out, yes, do that. But again, that's not the solution. These are all Band-Aids. Uh, it doesn't fix the underlying problems. I love this quote from Maslek on burnout. Um, and one of my resources will have a podcast where she talks and I recommend people listen to it. She's, it's really great. She said, I used to talk about burnout as a red flag that warns you that something is going wrong in the worst workplace. Let me change that a little bit and say that it's more like the canary in the coal mine. The canary in the cage goes down in the coal mine. And if the canary is having trouble breathing and functioning, it's a sign to you that the workplace, the mine is dangerous. Too many toxic fumes, you'd better not send people down there. It's a warning sign, and this is really what burnout is in a sense. It's a warning sign of a toxic work environment, and what you should be doing is saying, what is going on to cause so many problems among people who work here? What you won't, don't want to do is try and make the bird tougher and more resilient, and it can take it. You know, if you can't stand the toxic fumes, you shouldn't work here. Again, it's a sign that it could get worse. You don't want to go there because it's harder to treat people at that point. So all those self-care and community care things, again, it, it, they're Band-Aids. She talks about how a lot of workplaces and dealing with burnout, they give more time off. They do uh, workplace uh, wellness programs. But what you need to do is make it so that you don't need to leave the workplace to feel good about yourself, that you can feel good about yourself while you're in the workplace. So this is where we talk about what the community should be doing to help alleviate all of this. Um, oh, wow, we're already half hour in. So, you know, really the community can do some things to alleviate this. When I started researching burnout, it was as an administrator. And when you read the articles about workplace burnout, it all talks about what bosses should do to make it better for their employees. When I started reading articles about open source burnout, it was about the self-care things. And there seemed to be a disconnect. So I wanted to say, what is it that communities can do that's similar to a workplace to make it uh, better? 
First things first, show kindness towards contributors. I use the word contributors, not volunteers. I know a lot of people like to use the word volunteers, but like I said, we're all doing as part of their job. Ben Shum, he was a volunteer after he left the probation because he wasn't doing it as part of his work. Uh, Jane Sandberg, she's a volunteer. Most of us are not volunteers. All right. So toxic communities can lead to burnout. Um, this is from a study that in open source communities have reported high stress levels from frequent demands for features and bug fixes and from the sometimes aggressive tone of these demands. Now, when I talked to contributors, they didn't feel like this was a big problem in the Evergreen community. They felt like there were some times that, you know, people could be demanding, but overall they felt like the community was supportive of contributors. Um, but there were times, you know, when people kind of expect things to be done for them, even though it's not something that really helps anyone else but that particular person. Um, I've seen it a lot, actually, at conference time, at interest group sessions where people start to talk about the things they don't like. And instead of talking about how they want to improve it, it's like, well, that's a stupid thing. Who would ever design it that way? And they're not thinking the person who developed it, the person who wrote the sophomore requirements are sitting in the room with them while they're talking about how stupid that thing is. Um, so, you know, you really want to be positive in that. I would say when you're talking about contributors, do it as if you're talking about a fellow coworker, preferably one that you like. You know, you, you're, 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 you're part of a team. One of the people I talked to said, it's hard to work on something really hard and not have anybody acknowledge it or that they turn around and complain about it. And I think we've all felt that before. So just think about that for the people who are helping to support this system. And while we're at this conference for the first time in four years, if you see a contributor who's done something for you, thank them. You know, I, that goes such a long way, just thanking the people who have done all of this. We all appreciate a little recognition in our work. And this, I just was a late minute addition to our slide to illustrate the point. So this is from uh, Andrea and Ruth's session yesterday. I was monitoring Twitter when I was supposed to be working. Um, oh shoot, this is being recorded. Uh, New acquisitions dead should change your life. And if it doesn't, just let us know gently. We're kind of invested in it. And that's what it's all about. When you work on these things, you do. You pour your heart into it sometime. And then you don't want to hear, oh, though this doesn't fit my workflow. What were you thinking? You know, be gentle about it. The community is not your vendor. And I want to stress, this is a feature. It's not a bug. The community is not your vendor. Um, someone said to me, the they pronoun gets used a lot, and that sounds somewhat vendorish to me. I still use we. Use we to start with, and then it changes the way you're thinking about the community. And I think it's a hard transition. We have been, um, you know, ingrained with this whole vendor customer model. So it's hard when you first come into the community where you just want things to be done. Um, and, and you have to learn that we. But I've been working in a different model the last five years, and I'm kind of glad I have because I finally have firsthand experience to see it. And it's not that I, you know, I'm unhappy with my vendor. It's just different. It's, there are two places where I've really seen it. Here, the service providers I've worked with I am full partners and equal partners with those vendors. So I've had development projects where I've dis disagreed with the service provider about some implementation of it. Once it was a um, OPAC project, a public catalog project, I hate OPAC, um, and I didn't like the way it looked, but they really couldn't put more time into it. I know CSS, so I went and changed the look of it. And then I put them side by side for the community to decide, which one do you look like, like better? And the community decided, I may not have gotten my way, I did, but I may not have, but we know it's a fair process, fairness. That's part of you know not getting burned out. You might have a vendor who really does everything they could can to get customer feedback. But in the end, the vendor makes the final call and there's nothing you can do about it. That, there is a huge difference there. 
Um, and also, they're not going to get customer feedback on, they're, on the, they're only doing it on the big stuff. They're not doing it on every small little piece of development. And sometimes the small things are the ones that matter. Another way I've seen it um, is a vendor's concern is primary concern is with the sustainability of the company. And it should be because they want to survive. The community's concern is with the sustainability of the software. So as an example, the vendor may decide in order to be sustainable, we need to move into this other area that has nothing to do with the ILS. It may be uh, you know, some kind of marketing thing. It could be open access. It could be um, ERMs, whatever. It's, you know, they need to do that to diversify their products. And but they still have the same number of developers. So suddenly these developers are being moved into different projects. The community itself is concerned with the sustainability of Evergreen. And that's a huge difference. Now, when I talk about the vendors being concerned with the sustainability of their company, this isn't restricted to proprietary vendors. This is true of open source vendors too, right? So this leads to my next point, the vendor is not your community. So the vendor itself, they're certainly going hopefully support the community. They don't have to actually. You could have a vendor that only wants to host your system and has no interest in doing anything else to support the software. You have to think about that when you choose a vendor. You need to think of the short-term solution the vendor is offering, but the long-term sustainability of the software you're using. Um, you know, there is not one service provider in this community that focuses only on Evergreen. So it's only the community that is focusing on Evergreen, the combined efforts of everyone that goes, you know, everyone that is contributing to that software. Um, so one thing I'd like to advise when you're working with vendors, when I used to do development projects, I always, and I hope ECDI still does this, I always put something in saying, when you develop for us, we require you to share the code because our open source license does not require you to share code that you do against that software. If you share it, it has to match the license that you got the software under, but you don't have to share it if you don't want to. So make sure that your vendor is sharing it. You're still doing that, Ruth? Good. <laughs> But, and I've never done a contract for hosting or support, but if I did, I'm just saying, I would put something in there asking, how much time do you spend on community projects that's outside of what you're getting paid for? Ask those questions. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Get an idea of whether this vendor is concerned with the long-term health of your software and not just with providing you with a service because there may be a problem with the software that the vendors figured out how to work around, but it's, you know, they don't have the time to fix it in the community code. And that's fine for the people who know how to work around it, but for everyone else, it, it doesn't help anything. And just a point that the vendor is not your community, it means they're not responsible for fixing all the problems with the software but they do have an equal responsibility to contribute to the software that we all have. And we all should have a responsibility to doing that too, because they're equal partners. So we can't expect them to fix any, everything, but we can expect them to be engaged in the community and help with the software. Why are you not moving? Next thing, contribute, contribute, contribute. Please contribute, this will help with the overwork. We need coders, we need testers, we need quality assurance, we need documentation, we need website and wiki cleanup. Um, this is big. We need people with the initiative to find what needs to be doing. We always talked about having easy tasks for people to get started in, and that's important but we need people who can actually go and find what needs to be doing. You know, look at the documentation and say, why hasn't this been documented, rented, rather than having someone hand it to you? Because it's, it's hard, we're, we're all stretched for time. So, you know, you need that initiative. 
We need cat herders. We need people who can ensure goals of the project are being met. Uh, bridges, they're the people who can serve as the go-between for technical folks and end user. Elizabeth Thompson from Noble once called me the developer whisperer, you know, the, the person who can talk to both uh, types of groups. I, I always love that one. Talking about cat herders, and this comes from um, a blog po a post, why open source developers are burning out better programming. Managing code requires a lot of mental castle building, and it's hard to figure out how to divvy that up between multiple brains. It's why developers often take on more than they should. It's just too hard to delegate. Um, large company ma companies managing millions of lines of code need to figure this out, of course, so they do but a big firm can pay managers to wrangle the overhead, the frequent communication that a big broad project entails, the incessant touch, touching of base. A small unpaid project in contrast, rarely has anyone willing or able to do that stuff. It feels easier for the maintainers to do all the work themselves. So they do and boom, burnout. So having, making sure you have people who do that meta work and organize things is very critical. I, I, I like to point out, and, and Evergreen is an enterprise software system. It's not some small little project. We need big people to do big things. People who are thinking of contributing take risks. Step up to help with something, even if you're not sure you have the skills. Do something that's a little scary. It's not scarier than me getting up and singing karaoke. Don't worry about stepping on toes. Don't trample on them. You know, be cognizant of someone saying, maybe you're overreaching, but you know, step on toes every once in a while if you think something needs to be done. I always did. You know that. <laughs> um, it's better to overstep than just let work go. And I just want to remind you, this is a safe and helping community. You're going to stumble. You're going to make mistakes. And everyone has done that. And everyone was always so forgiving of me when I stumbled and made mistakes. They just appreciate that someone's trying to help out. So always remember that. I asked the contributors I talked to, I asked if they felt safe to ask questions and ask for help. Every single one of them said yes. I understand these are contributors that are already entrenched in the community, but I, I, I you know, I have seen people really be, um, and I think it's improved over the years too, that you know, people do tend to want to help out the people who want to help. Employers, you need to encourage these contributions. Um, you need to provide the time for your staff to contribute. Regular community days for staff or ideas. We used to do area meetups uh, in New England for bug squashing week. I say we used to. I think we did it once or twice. But our goal was to do it more often. Um, carve out specific days time for community work. Include community work in your job description, in your evaluation of goals. Make it part of your strategic and annual action plans. You are depending on this. This is a critical service you are using. You need to engaged in order to make sure it's still there for you five, 10 years down the road. Um, constantly reiterate to your staff that community work is part of the job. Someone said to um, me, they, um, if you know the employer was allocating time for this activity, it would make people not feel guilty about working on Evergreen. Now think about that. Employees are feeling guilty about putting work into the system that their library or consortia depends on to provide robust, stable system. It's, you shouldn't feel guilty to do this. They should feel like they're allowed to do it. Hire people. Hire highly technical staff who is not only supporting your system, but is working in the community. I was so happy as I was preparing the slide, actually, to see you know, Georgia Public Library Service is hiring a developer and Sitka is hiring a DevOps person. And, this, and both of these are new positions. So this helps grow the community so we have more contributors who can help out. And I know I'm at my 45 minute mark. You're gonna have to bear with me a little longer. Okay. <laughs> The technology adoption life cycle. How many people have seen this? I've seen it years ago. It's the whole idea of if you have something new, 
you, you know, you have your pioneers who jump on and they're the more technical folks. And as more and more people adopt it, it's more of your regular people. Um, I'm sorry, you, you tech people are regular too, okay. <laughs> um, so when I look at old dev meeting minutes from the early years, there is so much activity in them because you look at those early adopters, you know, Sitka and um, the Conifer group and all of them, they were all bringing all these developers and soft, you know, really smart software people with them. And they were all trying to figure this out. And, you know, I would say MassLink was probably somewhere in the early adopters area um, where, where we had that too. We were really looking at building blocks, but we weren't at that, you know, that blue area there. But as we get more and more people coming on libraries, they're doing it because the software is great and that's a great thing, but they aren't necessarily looking to have people do the things that need to be done to review and commit code. It's they're, they're relying on their vendor to do a lot of it. And maybe they're giving money to their vendor to contribute to the community, but we're starting, you know, a lot of those people in those early dev meetings, uh, I had just, there were 21 people in the first dev meeting minutes I saw, and that was what, a four hour meeting, three hour meeting? We don't want those anymore. Only six of those 21 people are still working in an evergreen system. And some of them are active and some of them not very active. So obviously there have been people replacing them, but it's certainly not at the same level of what we had in those early years. So this is where we might see some de declining, declining assistance with tech. Which comes to my next point. I didn't know if I wanted to talk about core committers or not, but it came up in enough conversations that I, I had to do it. Um, so I'm gonna explain this because not everyone is familiar with the evergreen development model. We have a group of core committers. There are 11 active ones right now, and they're the people who are allowed to actually push code into the core system. Um, and we have a policy here. You can't push your own code in as soon as you're done with it. The people who are pushing it in or merging it are people who review it. So someone writes code, there needs to be one other person who tests it and then can put it into the core software. Um, and then we also have a process by which anyone can review the code and they can have a way of signing off on it. So um, you might just, there are two ways to sign off. You can just write a text thing saying, I can, I sign off on this. I don't know the language of it. Or you can do it through Git, which is a more technical way to do it. I'm not going to do a Git. Jason already did that. Um, so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about core committers. So, they, and Jason Stevenson, a shout out to him for, he came up with this little program that made this really easy to figure out. And I think he's sharing it on GitHub at some point. No, no, this is the, the other one. Okay. Well, I mean, I didn't say we we're gonna do it right away. So you got time. So we're looking at who has been reviewing code and since 3.0, which was Galen's release back in I don't know what year. Um, and you're gonna see, a, 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 you know, I'll go through and explain what this means. I'm gonna skip Galen for a second. Um, so we got Jane Sandberg, she's a core committer. Um, it's bold, uh, 96 at 3.4, cause that's when she became a core, uh, core committer, but she was reviewing code before that. And, you know, prob probably part of that's why she became one. We have Bill Erickson, you know, he's doing, you know, a lot of uh, review of code. Then you have me and I haven't even been here for four and a half years. And I'm the one who comes up next. Just want to point that out. Um, Mike Rylander. Uh, Chris Sharp, he became a core committer right before I left. Um, Michelle Morgan, um, we have her at three points. So you're seeing she does a lot of review, but she only became a core committer, what, about a year ago? Um, so when I first did this about a year and a half ago, Michelle was not a core committer yet. Uh, so, you know, I look at the ones above that as core committers doing what they're supposed to do. I look at the next two as opportunities, okay? If you're looking at who you should be having merge to the core software. You look at look here. Um, and then we have Jason Stevenson and Dan Wells, who once again, Dan has not been in the community um, in a number of years or actively committing. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to Galen. 
This is unreasonable to expect from a fellow community member. I'm just gonna put it out there. It is absolutely unreasonable. This is too much. This is um, looking um, at a graphical view. Now this is committers only, not just the people who are signing off. And if you look, 3.6, 3.8, 3.10. Galen was merging more than half of the code. Now, I think he was release manager for some of those, but I'm not sure because I wasn't here. But I will point out that he was also release manager at 3.0, and he was not committing that much. And here at 3.7, he might as well have been doing half the code. It's that close. So he is carrying the weight. I figured out what's happening. Our Galen, I am sorry to report, is violating cat labor laws. If you don't know Galen, he says he's a cat person, but now I'm beginning to question it. So my next few slides are the mission to save Galen's cats. Because we don't want these poor cats working on our software anymore. The, the most they want to do is holding down the furniture. They don't want to do anything more than that. Um, I talked to six core committers. I asked them if the current core committer model is working. Some said yes, some said no. All of them agreed whether it's working or not that not enough core committers are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is merging code. Um, why are my, am I highlighting them? because you could say the same about documentation. There aren't enough people doing documentation. There aren't enough people writing code. There are not enough people doing the websites. Um, I think the reason why this gets so much attention is first, this is a case where someone's already done something to improve Evergreen, and they're just waiting for someone to say, okay, this looks good, it's going in. So there's a bottleneck there, and you want those people to feel good about their contribution. Another reason is this is a very select group of individuals. If those 11 people are active core committers, you have to have gained the trust of the other developers to be in this role. So if those individuals aren't doing their part, it's difficult just to pull in a volunteer to help out. So you get bottlenecks. And as important as documentation and website updates are, it all comes down to the software. You need code to have the software grow. That's what it all starts with. You can't document something that doesn't get put into the software. So this is why we kind of look at this. Um, I'm gonna talk about my experience. I said a year after I was um, involved in the project that I all of a sudden had a whoa moment. Uh, you, you had a hack away. I didn't go because I was working on another system. Uh, but I like to peek at what everyone's doing, and Galen shared this slide at that Hackaway. And I looked at it, uh, I was a core committer. In 2016, I was up there high. 2017, I don't know what point Galen was making, but I, I drew my own judgment. You know, I was neck and neck with Galen, I almost beat him. Then 2018, and then boom, that's when I left. I had a split second moment of guilt and then I felt tremendous relief. And I had no idea where that feeling of relief came from because one of my favorite things to do in the community was review code and merge it. So I didn't understand why am I feeling relieved about not doing something that I enjoyed so much. Um, so it, I had a, it took me about a year to figure this out. And we're going back to that whole thing, the, the gap between expectations and reality. The whole time I was a core committer and I was listed on the wiki page, it was such an honor for me. And I felt like I had to continually earn that privilege to be on that page the entire time I was a core committer. They go to inactive six months after they leave the community. As soon as I left, I, I told Gail and I was doing this, so I'm taking myself down right away because I'm not doing it. I'm not earning my place anymore. Why put my name up there? You know, to me, that was important. And I never expected other people to do as much as me because like I said, they weren't given the same amount of time, but I kept thinking, what if they just reviewed one branch a month, every core committer? What kind of difference would that make? I mean, surely one branch a month or two or you know something like that. So that's where I, I felt the relief was in the 
thinking of the potential, the promise of where we could be if we were all participating, but constantly not seeing that happen. And I'm not saying this to make anyone feel bad about it because I know I'm at a you know, consortium now where we're providing direct support. I know that not everybody has that time. Uh, we're, we're competing demands, but it's a problem. We need to kind of try to figure out because it was a continual frustration. And I know from, based on my conversations, I am not the only one who feels that way. I don't know the answer to this. Um, I know that doing this every other hack away and saying core committers, you have to do more doesn't work because we've been doing it for years. I would suggest reevaluating how you select core committers. It's about the review, not about the code. Yes, they need to know some code, but it, it's about do they put the work into reviewing the code? Do they tend to sign off on things that are good? And um, can you trust them? Specifically, can you trust them to know what they know and what they don't know? Because as a core committer, I might sign off on something for functionality, but I knew that this person wasn't familiar with evergreen code and I couldn't read it, so someone else would have to do it. And I think there are a lot of people in the community can do that. I think you need to take risks on the people in your community. And I think the people in the community need to take risks to know that they can step up and do this, even if they don't understand the entire code base, because I sure didn't. Um, so in my opinion, some coding ability, yes, the ability to use Git, absolutely. But beyond that, it's people you can trust. Uh, Jane Sandberg threw me into the path of something in that Carl Fogo wrote when he did producing open source software. And I know that was a long time ago that he wrote that, but he was like a good basis for choosing committers is the Hippocratic principle. First, do no harm. The most important criterion is not technical skill or even deep familiarity with the code, but simply that a person show good judgment. Judgment includes knowing what not to take on. Someone might post only small patches fixing fairly simple problems in the code, but if his patches apply cleanly, do not contain bugs and are mostly in accord with the project's log message and coding conventions, um, basically you should give him commit access. I'm not reading the whole thing. Um, so, and he said, even if it's for small things, it helps alleviate the load for the people who do the big things. So really think about that is what I would suggest. Short-term appointments, I don't know how I feel about this, but in my network, when we have committees, every year we ask them, are you still up for the challenge of being on this committee? And if not, we put new people on it. Maybe we have not take away a commit bit, but maybe we have for this release, these are the people who will be primarily responsible for merging code. So you don't feel like you constantly have to do it. Something like that. Just new ways that aren't just commit, 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 because we, we have to come up with something new. And then the other thing, if you can write code, please start reviewing it. I know there are people who contribute code who never review it. And if you start reviewing it, maybe you can become a core committer too. And if you're not sure if you wanna review that code, do it for the cats. Look at those guys, they are so relaxed now. It's like, in case anyone was worried, Galen would never do that to his cats. I just wanna make that clear. <laughs> but his cats need their human to be available to cater to their every need, okay? They're cats, they don't want half attention. Succession planning, I'll go very quickly through this before I get to my main point. Uh, so anyone ever thought about when these three guys retire within a few years of each other? It's a long time away, but we have a complex code base. Start thinking about it now. One thing I would recommend, you know, I talked to Ron Gagnon last fall, um, and he was talking about at Noble, they were moving away from custom things to more standard things so that you know, as people turn over, it's not so hard to get them to manage those things. And so I've been trying to do something similar to that um, at my own organization. We all know that cross training is important. So maybe um, you know, not having so much, and I know this is hard because the reason we do open source is because of custom things. Um, you know, when you implement tools, follow their conventions. And um, 
make sure there isn't one person responsible for one area of the code base. So I'm gonna ask the question, is there an area of the code base that only one person knows how to do significant enhancements to? Anyone? Would you like to name it? Because you know I love talking about this topic. Mike, do you know of an area of the code base only one person can make it significant improvements to? Ooh, I just lost my thing. Search. Um, this is from a statement I made, a very wise person made year, years ago. Search is critical, the most important part of the ILS. A strong search is what allows our users to access our resources and find materials that will then become holds and checkouts in the system. It's the reason why we enter our order and bibliographic records in the system with structured data so that users can leverage that structured data to find the information they need. This is an important part of the system and one person can make changes to it. Mike and I disagree on the approach, but we did agree on the fact that it's bad that only you can do it, right? And I am not going to say that means we move to solar elastic search. I was going to say that, but I got talked down from it. <laughs> so um, it, we need, it, it, it's not only that it relates to burnout, but um, Here's another aspect of it. In ALA, they talked about open source a lot. And I was at a panel that Sebastian Hammer was at. And I, I love this quote he made. He said, value of open source was misunderstood when people were talking about free as in kittens. It's about the conversation. And that has resonated with me because that's what it is. It's conversations. Here's an end user conversation. What do we want to name the new list? We went with basket. There are people who probably would have preferred the book bag, but um, you know, it was fair. People voted on it. I'm sorry, this Mike Carr's um, people, the next slide is in reference to something that probably caused burnout for two developers and one project coordinator. So I apologize, I'm, you know what it is. Um, developer conversations, support for conditional balances, a highly technical discussion. And the code was merged at comment number 96. There were a lot of people involved in that discussion about the best way to do this. I just wanted negative balances removed. Search discussion. And I, I put this up here, and I, this is the only MassLink project that never made it into the core software. And I do not disagree with the approach that was taken. It's just illustrative. When we talk about search, it's like, I did let you, I have been loading this on my, uh, what is it? Mike's comments give me cause for concern and I am not to pre prepare to commit this to master against his judgment. We always have to defer to Mike's judgment because he's the only one who understands how all these pieces fit together. So all of a sudden the conversation comes to an end and this is what can lead to a feeling of ineffectiveness for the person who may understand a lot about search but can't explain you know, what needs to be done for the developers who are coming into the community and trying to do it. And I'm not saying that they sh should be put in the way they did it, but I'm saying they start to think there's one person who's being a problem and, that might, and Mike's doing what he should do. So I don't want to say you're a problem. I'm just saying he's doing what he's doing, should do to protect the code. But if there were more people who understood it, we could maybe have a fuller discussion about next approaches is what I'm saying. Purposeful abandonment, very quickly. We need to purposefully abandon things, not just plain abandonment. So take time every once in a while to say, what are things that are sucking up our time and resources for very little value and can we stop doing them and that frees up resources to do other things just plain abandonment is you no longer have time to do things that were always conventions in the community we used to have predictable releases with a monthly bug fix release and two annual feature releases we don't have that anymore installable open surf and evergreen packages i'm not going to go there um, twice daily test runs that would report out in our irc so if they failed we could see it it's not that we should keep trying to do this, but if we're falling off, let's talk about it. We're not discussing it to see, well, what do we do? Maybe we want predictable releases, just not so frequent. 
you know, how do we fix this? Or we don't want time-based releases from people. <laughs> So, you know, but it needs to be a discussion so that you just don't have people saying, when's the next release coming? Now, this is the whole reason for the talk. And I know I'm running out of time. We need to try something new. Everything I just talked about, we've talked about since 2010. And we keep coming back to it. And we're at that point in our adoption cycle where we're getting fewer and fewer technical people. So. It's just talking about more contributors is not going to bring us where we need to be. We have 501c3 status now, and I think it's really time we start thinking about bringing staff on the project. And I know that the board's been talking about this. I'm not coming here with a new idea. What I am coming here and saying to do is to tell you, I know you can do this. I know that the project can do this. So I'm going to go back to my beginning of my talk. Um, the reason I know you can do this is because it's already been done. The three consortia, then two in Massachusetts, supported staff whose primary purpose was to contribute to the project. I don't think we knew we were doing that at the time, but that's what they were doing. So let me look at the, my project. I used to track my time in the end. About a third of my time was committed to Noble and CW Mars. But a lot of that was overhead, the policies, the budget, things you have to do anyways for any kind of project. So that probably could be split in the other areas as well. Very little of it was to support them. Third of my time was for the development initiative, but those were community projects where I did a lot of community work. And a third of my time was community. And my biggest regret from when I left Evergreen was when we looked at this, as I was leaving, we said, okay, we don't need the MassLink Partners thing anymore. We bundled the development initiative into Evergreen Indiana, so that kept going. The community stuff, well, the community will take care of it. That's what I said. I don't think I understood the value of having someone who is not supporting a system who can contribute to a community. So if three consortia can support what was in uh, fiscal year 2016, one and a half staff members, just imagine what 22 consortia and 27 libraries could do. You could be unstoppable. I know we wouldn't be able to get every, every, every Evergreen institution to contribute, but we should be able to get enough institutions to have that same number of staff. And there is no reason this entire community can't pool their funds together the way the MassLink partners did to support this. So what would you get with this? And I know nobody's been talking about one and a half staff members, but I think big. I think you can do one and a half, and I think you need it. You'd get a full-time cat herder. This is important. They can do the management of the 501c3, which is a small one. It's not a lot. They can do a lot of the organizing things, trying to cajole people into doing things, making sure we meet deadlines that need to be met. But they also have to get in and help out because this community does not do well with someone who directs people. It has to be someone, a bridge, who can do some of the work. But we also need a highly technical person. When we've had previous conversations about this in the community, one of the deal breakers is, well, how do you decide what kind of development they do? This isn't for enhancements. We already have ECDI. We don't need that help. We need those un people who do unsexy projects that a library is never going to fund. We need people who can do quality assurance. I love quality assurance. We need people who can talk, work on that project you've been talking about ten for 10 years to make it easier to install Evergreen. We need people to do the security things that are hard to get to, the big ones. I, you know, We need someone who can do those things that you just need to do for the infrastructure. How you fund it, donations don't work. We've tried that. A lot of places can't do that. It really, you know, some open source projects do sponsors. I don't think that would work. It really is a member fee, a membership model, similar to our state library associations have. I uh, tried to find an old email where I yelled at people who suggested having a membership model. I, don't, I haven't always said good things, um, but I think we can do this. I have. Um, Island or a project. I talked to Emil Suarez. I hung out with him for a day in Boston. He used to be a community member, and he's very active in the Island or a project. This is just one model. We could look at many. 
but they have membership levels. You could get a discount to the conference if you're uh, a member. You could, you know, we, it wouldn't link to code. The code is there, available. But we need to think about funding this community and keeping it sustainable. You'll see that they tie it to voting. And when I first talked to Emil about that, I said, well, that would never fly in the Evergreen community. But I keep thinking about it. And what I would want you to do is not take it off the table. And I know that's an unpopular opinion. The Island Door Project also has a way of saying, if you contribute, you also get a vote. It's not just that you are paying, but you contribute your time to the project. That's a way you can get a vote too. I'm just saying, we need to get serious about this. All right, and I know you can do it. With a little help from my hand, friends, that's a great song. So I would like to thank people last night who did not stand up and walk out on me when I sang out of tune. I go back to things people said, it's a place I want to be. It's a place I want to participate. All of us who are passionate about making the project succeed. This is what it's all about. This is why we're here. We want it to succeed. We can do this. We can pull together and make sure we have people here to help us with the next steps. So that's it. And I'm sorry I went long. I don't have time for questions, do I? I put questions, but I don't think I have time for questions. What was that? Yeah. Yes, I'll be here all day. So 15 minutes left of the break. <laughs>